All right, now we get to start the fun stuff. So now we are going to work on concept generation. Right? We've spent a spent weeks doing what we can to define the problem as 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 well as we can. Now we're going to try to come up with solutions, right? And so we talked at the very beginning of the semester about how how the design process is is a is an optimization problem, right? You have just an infinite number of possibilities in terms of solutions and you have to find find the solution that works the best and that's very very difficult so so what we're going to do is we're going to start that optimization problem by just doing a broad search of all the possible solutions right and it turns out and you know like most things in this class if you just try to do that on your own you won't always do a very good job. Sometimes you'll be freaking brilliant, and other and most of the time you won't. So the reason we have this class, right, is to make make this whole process more systematic, right? More systematic, so that we, if we can, we can remove some of the, the downsides of you being a human. Oh, that makes sense. They're great things too. Don't get me wrong. Creativity is amazing. Computers can't even do it. But we need to s remove some of our more, some of the downsides, right? What are some of those downsides? Uh, we like to fixate on particular solutions. Right? Particular solutions. If they become our babies. We don't want to get rid of them. We don't want to spend time thinking of any other possibilities. Um, we become fixated on particular particular parts of, pro of the problem. You know, often in times when we're designing a product, there's a, a cool problem in that product and a bunch, a ton, hundreds, thousands of not so cool problems, and we tend to focus on the cool ones. Um, so the design process exists to compensate for this stuff, right? We want to compensate compensate for our natural tendencies and let's not forget that we're also compensating for the fact that group work is difficult, right? So if you look at your book, there, chapter six describes several different ways of making, starting with, I think it's chapter, or section 6.5, talks about several different ways of making this whole process more systematic, too, right? And before that, they talk about lots of different ways of being creative. And I just want to say one thing real quick. There's actually a significant body of research that says that brainstorming You know, where you get together with a bunch of people and you just throw out ideas is not great. It's not bad. What tends to happen is people, the whole idea brought behind brainstorming, by the way, is um, everybody gets together in a group, you state the problem, and then generally you just try to throw out ideas. No criticisms, right? Um, but it turns out that when you're just throwing out ideas, those ideas are typically not good, <laughs> right? Typically not good. What's better, it turns out, is to go away by yourself and try to come up with solutions and then come together as a team and discuss those solutions, right? And then to go away again, try to come up with new solutions and to come back and do this iteratively. So you learn things every time you come back together as a group, but creative processes tend to be, tend to be, um, to be tend to be I don't want to say lonely but uh, something you do by yourself so all right the first thing we're going to do to to make this whole uh, concept generation process more systematic is we're going to break this down into sub problems okay what we want to do is we want to decompose your design problem 
design problems into smaller, smaller problems, so into sub-problems, right? Because very few of your designs will actually do one and only one thing, right? They're going to do a couple things, or maybe that one thing that they're doing is has several different sub-steps. Um, let's do an example to talk about this. So, uh, uh, we're going to go back to our example of the car seat, right? I just realized I'm doing the Spanish ejemplo thing. That's my, whatever. That's example. Car seat. So, we, we start, and when we're decomposing this, we start with the base problem. What is the point of a car seat? The point of a car seat is to restrain a child, right? This is our base function. But this has several steps, right? Um, it doesn't do much good to hold a child in a car seat unless you secure the seat in the car, right? So unless you secure the seat in the car, I mean, it doesn't much, do much good if your child is secured in the seat. Can't forget securing child in seat, and also important um, in the event of a crash, we want to distribute distribute those. Crash forces, right? So that, well, obviously the child is not taking all of that force in the head. You know, awesome. And we we actually can break these functions down even further, right? So securing the seat to the car. Um, this this has several different sub functions, right? First, we have to install. in car. And we also have to remove from car, right? Hope you guys are seeing a pattern here. Remove from car. Um, maintain position in Crash. All right. So what's that pattern? That pattern is is these these sub problems, these functions that this thing has to do, have the form of verb and a noun. Right. Our our product has to do something to something. Period. That's what we're going to worry about. Functions. What are the functions of our devices? Now, securing the child in the seat, we have to be able to quickly remove the child, right? Quickly remove child. We need to prevent them from wiggling out. Prevent wiggling out. And what else? Um, I'm pretty happy with that. Oh, prevent them from flying out in a crash, right? Flying child. Great. So, remember, verb, noun. What about distributing crash forces? That's, that's pretty self-evident, right? That's, that can stand by itself. So we've created, we've broken down our problem, which is to restrain a child, right, in a car. And we've broken it down into securing the car seat secure, to the car, securing the child in the seat, and distributing crash forces. And we have several sub-ones too, right? Um, now you're going to find that some of these things overlap, right? So quickly removing child, preventing wiggling out, preventing flying child. Um, you could combine 
obviously you can combine all these things into securing child in the seat. So what we're going to do next, right, is we're going to identify the, the major functions, which are mostly at this level, the second level here, right? First level, second level, third level. We're going to identify those, and we're going to try to come up with solutions for each subproblem. Each of those are a subproblem, right? Um, and you know what? Let's let's write it down here on the next page. So we're going to come up with solutions to all these subproblems. So what were those subproblems again? Um, secure seat to car. Right, secure the seat to the car. We need to secure the child to seat. Right? And finally we need to distribute forces in crash. So when you're coming up with solutions to your your entire design problem, you're going to try to focus on each of these major sub, uh, coming up with solutions to these major sub uh, problems. Right now, we're not going to worry quite so much about all the details, right? So we don't worry with a car seat about um, how we're going to mold the plastic, what kind of plastic are we going to use, um, what, what even what material we're going to use. We're going to keep these things. Those are things we can solve later. That we have to solve these major subproblems first. So you have these things, and each person in your group is going to try to come up with at least one solution to each of these subproblems, right? And they're going to come up with a, a general solution too, right? That's going to be composed of these subsolutions. But we want to come up with subsolutions to these problems, at least one per member of your group. Hopefully, more than one for each person. So. When you do this, right, then you can start listing them. So what's our, what are ways to secure uh, secure the seat to the car? Um, we can thread. Let's, actually, let's keep, let's mix it up over here a little bit. We can thread, uh, thread seat belt. You know, thread the seat belt through the, through the car seat and then latch it. It's awesome. Every every car since 19, say 86, I'm guessing here has to have a back seat belt. Or actually, since like 1960, it has to have a back seat belt. But thread the seat belt through. Awesome. We can do that. More modern cars have a use the um, use special. Right? More modern cars have special mounts above and below the seat that you can hook the seat to very quickly. And I had trouble coming up with ideas on the, on the fly, so we're going to say Velcro, which I know is not a great idea, especially if you have leather seats, but whatever. All right, now what about all ideas to secure the child? Well, we could do a three-point harness. three-point harness like like you have in the front seat, right? Um, we can do five-point harness. With one latch. Got to specify that. Five-point harness with one button to release. Uh, it's actually really fascinating. Um, so American car seats in general can't be sold in Europe because Europe requires that you can have to only push one button to release the child from the car seat. And most uh, American car seats have uh, multiple buttons and latches. So fun fun fact. Um, and the reason they have that is because you want to remove the child quickly. I think I've said this before. But anyway. We could do a lap bar, right? A lap bar like like you have at a roller coaster. Awesome. I think that'd be hilarious. It also train them well to go to, to Six Flags. All right, we need to distribute the forces in a crash. So how can we do that? Well, we can shape, we can um, closely uh, closely shape 
the seat so that no part of the child's body is far away from the seat. That way, in the event of a crash, they're not going to move very far, right? Um, if they have to move very far, then there's a possibility that only one part of their body is going to stop moving um, before everything else stops moving, which means a lot of force in that one spot, right? Closely shaped seat. Don't want to allow anything to just start flying around. We could use an airbag. Why not, right? Start putting airbags in our, our kids' safety seats. Um, uh, wide straps will help, too. Awesome. So what's cool now, I'm assuming we had at least three members in our group, is now you can start mixing and matching all these different solutions, right? We don't, we don't have to take these concepts that you guys develop wholesale and, and, um, and that's it, right? Say Joe has a, a great idea and Susie has a, a great idea, but together if we combine their ideas, it's an amazing idea. That's fine. Um, remember how I talked about earlier about us wanting to kind of like protect our ideas? We don't want to do that here. So what you can do now is you can combine these in, in weird and interesting ways, right? We can thread the seatbelt through the seat using a lap bar and an airbag. That's awesome. I think that's a cool idea, actually. We could use Velcro with a three-point harness and wide straps, and that's it. We can use special mounts, a five-point harness, and closely shaped seats, right? And actually, this is what most car seats today do. Because with a five-point harness, it's hard for the child to wiggle out. With special mounts, you know that the car can handle it, and the seat can handle all the forces. And with a closely shaped seat, the, the child isn't going to wiggle out very far. And actually... We can use both wide straps and closely shaped seats. So we can combine these things into one concept, right? And what you'll do is you'll, you'll combine these in interesting ways and develop several main concepts, okay? Several main concepts. And the next thing we're going to talk about is how to evaluate those concepts.